Hello and welcome to Siglafjordr. You might be asking yourself, Brent, what is it that I'm looking at here? It looks like you're standing on an airport runway and that is exactly what I am standing on. Don't get to do that very often, right? Well, this is a runway outside of Siglafjordr, uh, out kind of in a bird preserve. Uh, so you'll hear a lot of birds throughout the course of this office hours. So I'm like, why not? I never get a chance to do this. So let's do this. Give you all something interesting to look at. And hopefully we won't have something too interesting to look at. Hopefully we won't have a problem with like an airplane coming through. But if I have to grab the camera real quick and run, you'll know why. All right, so the first question. Uh, Doug asks, greetings, Brent. <laughs> greetings, Doug. I need to create linked servers. Not ideal, I know, which means that Doug has been reading my uh, blog over the past. He says, where connections are made using the login's current security context. Oh, God. And where logins can use either AD or SQL authentication. What are the tricks, gotchas, and best practices for linked servers? Oh, God, Doug. Okay, so the reason why I'm groaning, the reason why I'm like, oh, man, this is a terrible idea, is that this is a ripe problem for security issues. This is one of those cases where if something goes wrong and someone's login gets hacked, and I really worry about this with uh, any time that people use uh, uh, any kind of authentication where the application keeps a copy of the password uh, in some config file somewhere that somebody's going to inevitably check into a public GitHub repo or it's going to make its way through the company. Um, then you're going to start having issues where people can jump from one linked server to the next or, or create security issues. Um, so the, I, I get really nervous about this because you really want to hire a security professional at that point because it's such a such a huge risk. The way that I'm going to rephrase the question is, you're calling your doctor and saying, Doctor, I want to punch myself in the baby maker. Can you give me the best, I know I'm not supposed to, but can you give me the best practices for punching myself in the baby maker? Any competent doctor will tell you, just don't punch yourself in the baby maker. It's a bad idea. And I know people will go, but yes, but I want to anyway. What are the things that I should look out for? You should look out for punching yourself in the baby maker. It doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? Uh, so just because your managers want you to do something like that, doesn't mean that you actually have to do it. And I'll give you an example from uh, one of my bosses in the past. One of my bosses in the past, Don Duncan, who I loved working with, brilliant uh, shout out to Don there in South Florida, uh, uh, drew me into his office one day and he's like, wait a minute, why are you giving me a solution that you don't like? If you don't like the solution, don't give it to me. You're an expert. I pay you for your advice. Don't bring me bad solutions if you're not comfortable with them. Say, I'm sorry, we don't support that. Because you know how you've worked with a third party vendor at some point and they've said, you know, we don't support or we only support SQL Server 1942. You know, they have all kinds of crazy ideas. Uh, well, you can say, I'm sorry, in this company, we don't support that. And somebody says, well, I want to do it. Sorry, we don't support that. That's a bad idea for all these reasons. And then you link them to videos like this. Um, so unfortunately, I'm just not going to give you best practices on punching yourself in the baby maker because it doesn't make sense. You shouldn't be doing that. Now, I notice as I'm watching this, too, uh, I'm watching the camera move a little bit. I got water all over the back of my phone. Um, I'm watching the camera wiggle, uh, wiggle it just a little bit. So I know that's probably going to be a little bit distracting there. I'll see if I can, like, fix, fix that out in post. I don't usually do any post-production on these, but I'll do, I'll do post-production on this because it's worth it just to have a uh, uh, shoot in office hours inside a uh, uh, runway. Uh, next up, Mache asks, Hi Brent, what is your recommendation on setting collation for a new database? Have you ever had a situation where you advised a customer to change the collation of an existing database? If yes, what was the reason? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, so, uh, is there ever a time where I would recommend changing the collation of an existing database? No because just because you change the collation of a database that doesn't change the contents at all you still have to recreate its contents in its new collation 
which typically involves creating, the easiest way to do it is to go create a new table with the collation that you want and then move all the data over into that brand new table. Um, because just because you change collation at the database level doesn't mean that all of the data is reinserted with the new correct collation that you want or is rewritten with the new collation that you want. It only affects new objects as they're created from here on out. Um, so no, I've never recommended somebody uh, change that. Is there ever a situation where during the creation of a new database that I change to choose something other than the default? Yeah, typically it's because of an application only supports certain collations. For example, you might have something that's built for international use that requires a specific international collation for their own, whatever their language is. But because of my weirdo role, because I'm really a performance tuning emergency consultant, they don't usually call me at the beginning when they're doing something. They usually only call me at the end when the thing's already on fire. So I don't have any best practices around uh, when to pick a specific collation, just because I don't, I don't get involved in that new part of development. But it's a really good question, though. Um, that would be a good example of a question to post over at dba.stackexchange.com because I bet there are people out there who have to regularly change it. Not, not change an existing database, but uh, pick a new one for a new database. Well, this is kind of related. Luigi asks, Luigi asks, what compatibility would you rec compatibility level would you recommend to use at the moment? Uh, so I have a whole blog post around which SQL Server version to use, but I don't have one on what compatibility level. My feeling with compatibility level is when you're starting a brand new application from scratch, when you're typing create database, you go with the newest compatibility level for the version of SQL Server that you're on. If you're on 2019, you should be on 2019 compat level, for example. But if you have an existing database, an existing application, leave it on the collation where it's at. Don't go about changing uh, collation, or I'm sorry, not collations, compatibility levels. Don't go about changing compatibility levels. Leave it on the compatibility level that it's at until you have a compelling reason to change it. Because when you change it, change equals risk. I don't want you changing compatibility levels and not gaining anything. People think, oh, I'm going to miss out on the brand new features. No, you're going to miss out on troubleshooting all kinds of things in query plans that worked really well for a long time and now suddenly don't work worth a damn. Uh, so I would leave it on the compatibility level that it's at. Um, if you do want to change it, don't change it at the same time that you do a SQL Server version upgrade. Upgrade SQL Server or build a new SQL Server of the new version uh, and then let it soak in for a couple few weeks so that people don't play the blame game and go, whatever you just did broke my application. No, dude, your application always sucked. It's just that now you're trying to play the blame game on me. It, same thing with changing compatibility levels. Wait until a couple few weeks after the, the SQL Server version is baked. People are happy with it. And then plan a time on a weekend when you're going to go change the compat level to the newer one. Track the plan cache for the next couple few uh, days and see which query plans suddenly go to hell in a handbasket. And don't be afraid to back the compatibility level back one version or whatever to whatever it was before while you work on troubleshooting queries that suddenly perform worse. Let's see here. Uh... Seems like there's no planes coming. I think there's there's a little bit of uh, water on the lens. Ah, I'm not going to clean that off. Screw it. Ah, do it live. Next up, Paul says, we have plenty of inefficient, high-cost queries that we're currently working on in optimizing our transactional instance. With that in mind, is it healthy or expected for parallelism weights to be the highest cumulative weights at 70% of our weights on an OLTP workload? So, Paul, this is tricky. Percentages don't matter. And I've actually got a blog post about this. Percentages don't matter when you're looking at weight stats. I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that your boss came to you, your manager, whatever is a more politically correct term, team lead. Say that your manager came to you and said, Paul, what's the bottleneck stopping you from going faster? 
and you say, well, 70% of the time I'm waiting on my application to compile, or I'm waiting on uh, Chrome to refresh the browser. Well, he'd be like, Paul, Paul, I, I, I don't really care about that. How many hours a day are you waiting on that? Because if you're only waiting 15 minutes a day, nobody should be worried about tuning anything there. You're not wait, working that hard. The rest of the time you're out playing, you know, tiddlywinks or whatever it is that you want to play. Um, but if you say 40 hours a day, you know, that of course that number doesn't make sense. 23 hours a day I'm waiting on blank. Well, then now it starts to matter. You know, so that's why we always use hours per I use a wait time per core per second ratio or per core per hour. How many hours of wait time have you racked up per hour per CPU core on a given instance? And then it'll start to be more meaningful. Because for example, if you have a four core server and in the span of an hour, it's not even waiting 15 minutes on something, then who gives a damn? It's fine, leave it exactly where it is. Uh, next up, Martin says, uh, and I'm going through the most highly voted questions over at PollGab, so if you see over in the description for this video where to go post questions, go through and upvote the questions that you want to see, and then that way that dictates what I read off on the broadcast. Because from periodically, like after this one, I'm going to go erase all the questions, because there's a bunch of stuff in there that nobody voted up, which I assume means no one actually wants to see. Instead, I'll just do runway videos. <laughs> Uh, Martin says, Hi Brent, we use a lot of temp tables to query our stuff. We appended GUIDs to the table names to get around temp table reuse. Uh, but it trashes the plan cache. Should we turn on optimize for ad hoc workloads? Or what would your recommendation be? Martin, you're not going to like hearing this. I should take a second to take a sip of my tasty beverage to think of how I'm going to phrase this. Martin, I don't, I don't think you're going to like hearing this, but appending GUIDs to every temp table, I see what you're doing, and I don't think that's a great idea. What I would do instead, now this, this advice doesn't uh, uh, hold for most of the people out there, but what I would do instead, if you really wanted to do that, is create an index on the temp table after the temp table has been created. Create the index, or sorry, create the temp table, then go create an index as part of a second step, because that will also get around temp table reuse, and you won't have the problem with the, the completely bloated plan cache. For those of you who want a lot more detail, I don't think Martin needs this. What I'm about to say, I, I think Martin was completely fine. I think just what I said for an answer there, Martin's going to understand what I meant. Um, but for those of you who uh, want to learn more about that, I have a Fundamentals of TempDB class where I talk about how your temp tables will actually get reused in a wildly unpredictable way, too, as well. Paul White has a great session or series of blog posts about that. If you want to learn more about it, uh, search for Paul White Temp Table Reuse. I also just realized I didn't say at the beginning of the video why there's like a hood here. So I have the camera. I wanted to pull the camera further back. So... So there is where we're at today. And it's a very foggy day today. So we'll come back over here. So yeah, so I had the camera there leaned against the car hood uh, to to reduce the, the buffeting. I have a really lightweight travel tr uh, uh, tripod with me at the moment, so uh, I don't have a nice sturdy tripod. I didn't realize I was going to be filming on a windy runway. Things I never thought I'd say. Uh, next up, Ann says, oh, Ann, good to see you, Ann Hills, uh, says, I'm supporting a SQL Server instance with data on two drives on a SAN, and it's all SSDs. I got 12 databases on one drive, it's like 700 gigabytes, and I got TempDB, 100 gigabytes on the other. Man, she packed an unbelievable amount of details into a small question box. 
She says, write performance is terrific for all user databases. It's like two milliseconds or less, but it's horrible for TempDB, 900 milliseconds or more. Any thoughts? Oh, that's such a good question. Okay, so there's two parts to this. One part is, should I be worried on high latency, on high writes, specifically on user database files or TempDB? My usual thought for that is no, I don't go there first for troubleshooting. I want to look at wait stats first. Because you can have uh, really high write stalls, like 900 milliseconds is a great example. You can have really uh, high wait, uh, uh, write stalls that just don't happen that often. Because what if you're only writing to TempDB once a day? and it's during a really small window, and during that window, other things happen to be going on. Like, let's say that you only do index rebuilds overnight. I'm not saying this happens, but it's a great example. Let's say you only do index rebuilds overnight between the hours of 11 and 11.15 p.m., at the same time that backups are happening, at the same time that other activity is happening on other servers that share the same SAN, at the same time that the SAN is doing maintenance, and nobody really cares about that time window, and nobody cares about the speed of those index rebuilds. I say, I'm, I'm saying index rebuilds because you could use the sort and tempdb option. So I don't, I don't start with stalls just because they can be catastrophic during a time window where nobody cares and then the, the drive isn't active the whole rest of the time. Now, so that's why I start with weight statistics first. So uh, the other part of that is the write activity in TempDB is different than how user databases work. With user databases, because especially you said transactional, in transactional workloads, you're not doing tons of writes all at exactly the same time. You're doing small point insert updates and deletes throughout the whole entire database, but in very small quantities. That ain't how TempDB works. When TempDB is working, what's causing it? I'll give you a few examples from the fundamentals of TempDB class. One, triggers like let's say that somebody is and triggers is a bad idea because it would be small inserts updates and deletes you're probably not loading a bunch of stuff into the triggers and tables and tempdb um so a, a query spills it runs out of memory somebody's trying to run a big select report uh the query gets a really tiny memory grant and tempdb is used to spill data to disk uh, when somebody does this big ugly report, they're push, just shoving, let's say, five gigabytes of data all into TempDB at the same time. That's a dramatically different workload than what you would have with the OLTP inserts, updates, and deletes that are hitting user databases. In addition, you're probably seeing uh, uh, eight TempDB data files or however many TempDB data files you have, and they're all writing to disk at the same time to handle all these gigabytes worth of data. That's why it would have such a different uh, response time, because the more you ask storage to do, the, the longer it's going to take on average. Just like if you give a human being a hundred tasks to do, on average it's going to take them a really long time to get the last task complete. So hopefully that those uh, two, two great questions at the root of that. Um, next up, William says, how do I set up an alert to send an email when there's a failed login? Oh, you do not want to do that. Because you'll have so many failed logins, you'll immediately have email overload. Don't do that. Instead, if you want to do something like that, just write it to a table or write it to a report file somewhere. But don't do, uh, don't try to send emails every time. Uh, if you wanted to do it, you could look at logon triggers. Again, though, I highly recommend not doing this because you can easily slow down your SQL server given the number of logins that are happening. So if you truly need it for like legal defensibility purposes, go buy an auditing tool, go buy uh, some kind of third party auditing tool uh, that will track when things like that happen because they'll be much faster than anything you're going to code yourself. All right, I accidentally clicked away from uh, pull gab there, so I'm going to go back in and come back into here. There's that. 
Uh, next up, uh, uh, Teresa says, has your opinion of table valued functions changed with any newer SQL Server versions? No, they still suck. Table valued functions, there was an improvement in like 2017 where SQL Server can run the function first to see how many rows are gonna come back and then use that to influence uh, row estimates throughout the rest of the plan. But performance is still absolutely catastrophically bad. Scalar functions got uh, a little bit better in SQL Server 2019, but not table valued functions. Those are still uh, atrocious. There were, I mean, Microsoft's gonna respond and be like, no, under certain circumstances, it's way better. Yeah, but those circumstances are few and far between. And the, the way that most table valued functions are used, that's still the problem. Uh, Brandon asks, when transparent data encryption, TDE, is enabled, what's a good way to measure overhead on the system? I don't care. No, hear me out for a second. It doesn't matter. If your business needs transparent data encryption, then you need it. Enable it. That's the end of that story. And whatever the overhead is, you have to deal with that. It's kind of like the transaction log. From time to time, I'll hear people saying, hey, I need to measure the overhead of transactional backups and transaction log, like how every time we do inserts, updates, and deletes, SQL Server writes to the transaction log. No, you don't need to measure that overhead. It has to happen. This is just something that's built in with databases. Or it, maybe you're saying, I'm trying to decide whether or not transparent data encryption uh, is needed by the business. That isn't dictated by the performance overhead. It's dictated by your security and compliance needs. If you need it, you need it. And that's just kind of the end of that story. Uh, next up, Milica says, Hi Brent, can highly fragmented indexes on large tables cause high page IO latch wait stats? What you do is go Google for more, you're on YouTube, so search for Brent Ozar fragmentation, and I have a whole hour long video going into details on that topic. I, I always want to go into it immediately and be like, all right, well, there are these two kinds of fragmentation. Here's what this one means. Here's what this one means. But I really need the visual demos. And so that's why I have that whole separate uh, lecture on that from the group by conference. Um, and the last one that we'll do, uh, let's see here. There's a bunch of them that all have three upvotes. Um, uh, my CR12 says, my friend never finds a simple way to find where an index is being used. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, where an index is being used, is there a way? Oh, that's a really good question. So uh, in theory, if you want to know what queries are using an index, in theory, you could look at the plan cache or query store. And the simple part of that, I just realized I haven't moved around, and I should probably move around there to give you the view of the center line. Um, the, the, the name of your index, let's say it's customer underscore uh, part ID underscore sales amount, the name of that index will be present in the query plan. And the query plans are just text, they're just XML, so you could go search for those. So you could, in theory, search the plan cache and or query store for the string name of the index. Now, that does require you to know uh, or have fairly unique index names, but you could go bigger than that if you wanted to. You can look at the string inside the plan and you could put together the table name and the index name and the, how, the, how that's phrased in quotes and all that. In practice, doing that is a string search, and it takes one hell of a long time. You can do it, it's just very slow, and it's CPU intensive while it runs. So uh, what I would say is, why do you want that? You know, what is it that you want it for? And sometimes people will say, I'm just curious while I'm doing index tuning, what kind of query would use an index like that? And I'm like, well, that's great that you're, that you're curious, but what action would you take? What action would you take based on that? And if you're trying to make the query faster, 
don't back into query tuning that way. Go look at the queries that are doing the most logical reads using SP Blitz cache sort order equals reads, for example, uh, and then focus on tuning those high read queries. All right, well, that, that wraps up the uh, airline runway episode. Well, airline is a stretch. There are no airlines that fly out here on a regular basis, but that uh, wraps up our airport runway edition of uh, Office Hours. Now, uh, let's see what y'all think of this one in terms of an oddball scenery. Um, and there are tons of questions, but most of them only have like one, two, three upvotes. So I'll go ahead and erase all those and we'll let them start over again from scratch. And then whatever y'all uh, vote highly next, I'll do another video. See, today uh, today we're up, or, up and around Siglafjordur in North Iceland. And we're getting ready to take a ferry to Grimsey. Grimsey's the further, for, I believe the furthest most northern part of Iceland. It's a little tiny uh, island up in the Arctic Circle. And we're even taking the truck. We're taking uh, uh, Flakari, or Flackery, I think the pronunciation is, our, our uh, Land Rover Defender taking it up on the island, just so that we can say we've had it up in the Arctic Circle. Should be kind of fun. So, all right, thanks for hanging out with me at Office Hours, and I'll see you all at the next one. Adios.